um, to the organizers for the introduction and the invitation, and thank you to all of you for coming. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to give uh, this talk in person. One of the things that I have missed most over giving talks on Zoom is interaction with the audience. So I really, really hope that everyone will feel very free to ask whatever question pops into their mind. I would much rather get a lot of questions and talk about the things that are interesting you um, than get to any particular point in my slides. So please, please, please just ask questions anytime. All right, so the topic of my um, lecture series is rational points on varieties and the brouwer monin obstruction. But this is taking place in the context of the broader theme of the whole PCMI program, which is number theory informed by computation. So for me, that means that in this, uh, in this lecture series, I particularly want to focus on things like what are the computational questions in this area? How does the computation inform and aid theory? And how does theory inform and aid computation? And I only have three lectures, and there's a lot of interesting work going on in this area. So even with this focus, just out of time, and it's me giving the talk, this is my perspective on these questions. Okay, so what I hope to do is give a broad overview of things that you can ask and uh, current, current developments that are happening, and then give you lots of pointers that you can go and explore further for whatever topic interests you. Okay, so the starting point um, of this area is this very simple question. So if we have some variety, some system of polynomial equations uh, defined over the rational numbers, how do we determine if we have, like what the set of rational points are? So you saw related questions in some of the talks earlier, uh, David Harvey's talk and then Drew Sutherland's lectures um, at the beginning where we were looking at curves over finite fields. You could also, if you're looking for elliptic curves over Q with a particular Galois representation, you normally end up looking at the equation for some modular curve that you want to study the rational points on. Maybe you're presented with a very classical problem like the rational box problem, which asks if you can find um, a rational box where the distance between any two pairs of vertices is a rational number. Okay. You write that equation down, you get a set of polynomial equations, and you want to know what, what are the rational points on this. Okay, so a naive approach when you're handed this problem is you could just start looking. You just start plugging in some numbers, you set a bunch of the coordinates to be zero, then you set a bunch of them to be one, you can make this systematic by searching in some box of bounded height. So you search and search and search. Maybe you find a bunch of points. Maybe you only find five points. Maybe you find no points. But you search and search. And then whenever you get tired of searching, you're led to this problem of how do I know if I searched enough? How do I ensure that I have found all the points? OK. Sometimes you'll have infinitely many, and then you'll know, OK, I definitely didn't find all the points yet. <laughs> but if you know that there's only finitely many, you could hope that you found the points. But you have to know if you found them all. When do you stop? And a very extreme example of this that I want to focus on is, say your variety, you're doing this search, and you find no points. You search up to height 5, and then 10, and 20, and 100, and it, a thousand and a million and you're still finding no points at what point do you give up and think okay there are no points how should I show that there are no points you might have start becoming very pessimistic that you're not going to find any but we're mathematicians at the end of the day if you want to stop and say that there's no points you have to prove that there's no points and searching for points will never help you prove that there are no points. You need a completely different method. So I am interested 
in rational points generally, but in this talk, we're focused mainly on this question. Okay, if you have, if you suspect that there are no points on your variety, how do you prove that there are no points? And this requires sort of a fundamentally different approach than if you think there are points and you're going to go search for them. Okay, so a general method sort of framework that happens, the set of rational points is often very hard to get a handle on. So what we do is we embed the set of rational points into some other set that is hopefully more understandable and computable. Okay, and some of you may have looked at these questions before. Some of the first sets that you might take are the set of local points. So you first look if there's real points, right? If my equation is of the form x squared plus y squared plus one equals zero, I know that all squares are non-negative, and so I can just give up and go home already. You can do the same thing by looking at periodic fields, and you can package all of those local conditions together into the set of adelic points. So these are some first natural sets S that you might take. Okay, and just, uh, since this is the fundamental um, idea of how we're going to approach this is once you have this embedding and if you can compute S and you can show that S is empty, well then you have, this is your proof that you have no rational points. Okay, so the idea is to find some set S that is more understandable or computable uh, and that we can hope to use to witness that there's no Okay, and sometimes the adelic points for some particular classes of varieties, that's enough to tell us everything. So a class of varieties is said to satisfy the local to global principle if for every such variety, the existence of adelic points implies the existence of a rational point. So Quadric satisfied that, this, that's the Moskovsky theorem. Also, any severi Brouwer variety, so any variety that geometrically is isomorphic to projective space, also satisfies the local to global principle. And let me just say, so this is a property that you want to know for a class of varieties. You want to know it before you start looking for rational points. So, a variety that has a rational point, just like a single one by itself, automatically satisfies the local global principle, but that's not necessarily in a, in a helpful way. So we want to know that it satisfies the local to global principle just based on maybe some geometric information or the degrees of the equations or the um, number of variables. Uh, that's the, the type of thing we're looking for. But these two examples that I've put here, quadrics and severi Brower varieties, those are both very, very close to projective space, which is a geometrically very simple variety. And unfortunately, when we move into more complicated varieties, curves with higher genus, higher dimensional varieties, um, better? <laughs> You're supposed to tell me. You just said this whole thing. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, once we move into more complicated varieties, the local to global principle typically fails. So the set of adelic points is no longer enough to generally tell us when we have rational points or not, and we need some refined obstruction set, some set S that better approximates the set of rational points that we can use to detect when there's no rational points. Okay, and so that that um, is really the main focus, this particular obstruction set that we'll study that can witness the lack of rational points. So this is ca called the Brouwer-Mannan obstruction. 
Um, and I will, this will maybe come up a little bit later. You can talk about obstruction sets for other properties uh, of rational points. This just not only existence. But as I said at the beginning, I'm going to focus on this extreme case. Can we try to prove that there are no rational points? So I'm focused on the brouwer modern obstruction to the existence of rational points. Um, but that's a mouthful, so it will usually just be abbreviated. OK. So our goal uh, is to define this intermediate obstruction set that tells us potentially more than just um, the information that's contained in local solubility. And this intermediate set is called the brouwer manen set. And I started this over Q, but uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to switch to working over some number field K and define it in this generality. Much of what I say also works for global, global fields of positive characteristic, but I just don't want to keep adding characteristic assumptions at the various places well needed, so I'm going to stick to the case of number fields. Um, but much of what, what uh, I say holds in greater generality. Okay. All right, and as I said, um, so the goal is to define this set. It's a set that the k rational points embed into, and so when this set is empty, then we say that there's a brouwer modern obstruction to the set of rational points. So this set is what we call an obstruction set, and this is the thing that I want to study. Okay. Any questions up to here? Yes? The adelic points combine together all of the local, um, the local points. So you can define this in terms of the Adele ring, which comes up Maybe you see it in a class field theory book. But for this talk, because I'm always going to be working with smooth projective varieties, the set of adelic points, I think I can do this. Yeah. You can just think of this. This is the product over all the places, including the ones dividing infinity, of the set of points over the completions. So it's packaging together all of the local information. Great question. So you'd be really bad. We didn't ask that question. Uh, it is, in general, a restricted product, but because I'm working with projective varieties, you, there's not the restriction there. So in general, you have to, yeah, it's a different set, but so this is using, this is because x is projective. Okay, x, x is always going to be smooth and projective in, in my talk, so I'll just include that there. Great. More questions? Yes? Yeah, so when I'm looking for global fields of positive characteristic, so like FQ of T, much of what I say still goes through, but there's some things that I might say that might not hold if like the order of a particular element is not prime to the characteristic or so like some things that I write down, you might just have to be careful when you're looking at the characteristic. And that's a thing that I'm particularly bad at asking, answering questions about during talks. <laughs> I feel like I always forget to do the various characteristic assumptions. So, um, but yeah, and, again, and I give a lot of references in the notes, so you can always look up the more general statements there. And let me just say, so I said this is a question about global fields. So for finite fields, I mean, you could ask the same question. And we saw lots of, um, yeah, as I said, that that was the topic of David Harvey's talk today, Andrew Sutherland's lectures. So that's also a very interesting question. But there's a, a more straightforward, just like effectivity result in terms of an algorithm, because you can enumerate all the all the points in projective space over a finite field, so you can, by enumeration, you can check, you can prove that there's no FQ points, and you can't do that here. So, uh, the the question is, the point of view I'm taking is most of interest when you have already an, an infinite field. 
Okay, and I think I for forgot to repeat all of those questions, so I'm going to try to do better next time. <laughs> Any more? Okay, keep them coming. Okay, so I'm going to define, well, work up to the definition of what this uh, brouwer manen set is, but it can be kind of a mouthful to get all at once. I'm going to work through it in a particular case and just assume some things to get us started. Okay, so right now I'm just going to assume that I have this magic machine, black box, some oracle in the sky, that given any f rational point on x, it produces for me a conic. And this probably, if you've never seen this before, probably seems like a very random machine that I want to use. Um, <laughs> that's totally okay, but I'm just going to pretend that I have this thing and let's see what we can get out of it. Okay? So I just have some way, like a conic making factory that takes in varieties and just like spits out conics that I want to work with. And so, uh, and if you want, you can think of this you can think of this as really giving like just two coordinates if you want, because you can, since I'm in characteristic zero, I can always diagonalize to my conic and I can scale to make one of the coefficients one. So I can always write it in this form. So my conic making machine, I could really just think out of as a machine that's just spitting out these coefficients ax and bx for my conic. Okay, so for the set of k rational points, which I don't know how to compute, I'm trying to understand what that is, but if I had it, I could plug it into this machine and it would spit out for me a bunch of conics. And I can do the same thing for the adelic points. So that's really giving me a collection a collection of conics, one for every place, and then I have a whole set of those for every, every uh, adelic point that I have there. Okay, and I have my inclusion that we already saw, that the k points embed into the kb points. And if you prefer, just you can think of k as just q everywhere. You'll retain a lot of the and all the examples in the exercises are for Q. So you can work with that generality. Okay, and this is my machine that I've dreamed up so I can assume that it has some nice properties so that I have some way of like, it's functorial, has some nice commuting properties. So if I have a K point and I view it as an adelic point, the, the box gives me the same, same set of conics. Okay, so now what we're trying to do, remember what we want, is some intermediate set in here. We want to find some set that sits in between these two things. So we want to know, well, what, what is something special about the k-rational points? What do they have to satisfy that potentially the adelic points don't always have to satisfy? What can I get from them? And um, you'll see the top of the slide tells us that I'm, I'm going to use quadratic reciprocity. So let's try to understand what quadratic reciprocity tells us about these conics. And this, let me just say, this is probably not the way you were taught quadratic reciprocity. <laughs> Uh, when you first learned it, but I'll explain why I want to present it this way. Okay, so one thing that you, um, that is true, and is in one of the exercises to prove over Q, that for any conic over, uh, let me put this on the board just to have, let me just do this over. So if I have a conic over Q,
So I could look at the number of places where this conic fails to have a local point. And it's not too hard to show that this set, that this is always finite. And so in your, in your, uh, in the problem session, there's an exercise that outlines how to do this. And in fact, this is something that's true in, in great generality. If you have any smooth variety over, well, any variety over a uh, positive dimensional variety over a number field, the set of places where you fail to have local points is always finite. So that's always true. But something even more is true. Quadratic reciprocity tells you that not only is this set finite, it's always even. Okay, this is not the way you learned quadratic reciprocity. I am like almost 100% positive. But I like phrasing it this way, one, because it's gonna help me define the brauer manin set, but also because it makes clear like how absolutely unreasonable it is that quadratic reciprocity holds. Like quadratic reciprocity, it just has no right to be true, and it's true. So let me explain to you why I think it has no right to be true. So say I have this conic, which I can think of as just giving this A and B. So I don't know what they are. I hand them to you. You tell me all of the finite primes, just the prime numbers, where this conic fails to have a solution. From that, that list of finite numbers where it fails to have a solution, I can tell you about the signs of A and B. Now, primes, when you work mod P, they know absolutely nothing about signs. Like, there's no notion of positive and negative in FP. But somehow, quadratic reciprocity tells you, if you work with all of the primes, you look at the solution on all the primes and sufficiently high pri prime powers, it will be able to tell you if A and B are both negative. That shouldn't be true. It just shouldn't be true. But it is true, and that's, yeah, so we should use that. <laughs> it's like this amazing, surprising fact that we should be able to use to, like, to our advantage. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So what we know is that if we have a conic over the rational numbers or over our number field, the number of places where it fails to have a point is even. So I can look at just now, I can take an arbitrary collection of conics, one over each completion. They may not all come from the same thing, but I can just say, okay, let me look at the, the set of collections of conics that the set of places where they fail to have lo local points is even. That is a subset that I can take. Okay. And so the idea is that we want to use this our intermediate obstruction set should be the set of adelic points that gives us this thing in the middle. Okay. This set S, which is going to be our brauer manin set, maybe slightly generalized, I mean, I think this is not really an intuitive thing. Like, maybe when you get used to thinking about it enough, like I've thought about this for many, many years now, um, it's like, fine, I'm used, we're, we're good friends, me and the Brower Monin set. 
<laughs> but it it feels can feel contrived and it can feel like weird that it works and I think that's because it's weird that quadratic reciprocity is true this is not an intuitive thing that like, okay, we're used to working with it. I feel like it's like a number theory test that you have to love quadratic reciprocity. <laughs> so like, it's something that, um, yeah, we're friends with, but it is surprising. And I think that that surprisingness of this fact makes it hard sometimes to wrap your head around this Brauermann and set. And it's, it's not a, for lack of trying, it's just because it's a surprising condition that is imposed. Yes? Yeah, so these CXV, um, they're just a collection of conics over any local field. So the number of places, it's a different conic. I can have a different conic over like Q3 than I can have, oh sorry, the question was, <laughs> what is the difference between this set on the left and the red set in the middle. And the difference is the one on, on yeah, your left, is um, that's just a collection of conics over each completion that may not have anything to do with each other. So I can pick whatever conic I want over Q2 and then a totally different conic over Q3 and a totally different conic over Q5 and so it's possible for them to fail to have um, local points at an odd number of places. Or maybe they fail to have local points at an infinite number of places, depending on what this black box is, right? I haven't, I haven't described this um, squiggly arrow. This is just my like imagined black box machine, which is doing something. So right now at this stage, that machine could do anything give you like whatever thing you want. Um, yes? Uh, so the question was, do I have to ask for each conic in this collection, this black one, to be defined over Q? And the answer is no. These are conics defined over the completions. Yes? Yes? A little higher. Okay. Great. The question was, can I hold the microphone a little higher? <laughs> yes? Oh yeah, so sorry, when I'm saying that I'm leveraging quadratic reciprocity, that's really happening over, I guess, really that's equivalent to over Q, so for K equals Q. Um, and then in three or four slides, I will say how I'm thinking of quadratic reciprocity for a number of fields, which is basically just this, but <laughs> yes. Okay, more questions. I love it. So many. Keep them coming. Okay. So, so now I have showed you how to give this intermediate obstruction set, assuming I can build this black box, right? This whole thing rested on this assumption that I have this magic machine that takes in points and spits out conics, and it's in some nice way so this diagram commutes so that the, the, the way of making conics um, is compatible with the inclusion of the k-rational points into the kv points. So now I have to justify that part or show you how we can make a machine. Okay, so conics, as I've said, if you're in characteristic not two, which we are, then you can just think of them as two numbers, and you're just looking at an equation like this. So I think in one of the um, previous lectures, you saw something very similar looking to this. Oh, great. Yes. Yes. 
Yes, that's not clear yet. So right now, yes, thank you. The question was, I said this set S, but how do I get it? Because I just magically drew it. So really what happens is that I'm saying now, I also want to like make my black box machine even better. So not only can I run it forwards to kick out these conics, I can reverse it and stick the conics back in and spit out the adelic points that gave it to me. Yeah, so that, that is something that I have to, have to justify. Okay, yes, so I think in some of the lectures, you saw some objects, maybe they were given by A and B, I forgot to ask this part, but specified by two numbers, Q algebra, whose center is exactly the field, and that has no non-trivial two-sided ideals. And this conic is an example of a severi brower variety. I mentioned that earlier in the slide, these are varieties that are geometrically isomorphic to projective space. And it turns out, in general, there is a correspondence between severi Brouwer varieties and central simple algebras. And so there, and there is something that sort of classifies both of them. So you can take the set of central simple algebras up to what's called the Brouwer equivalence, or you can take the set of severi Brouwer varieties up to isomorphism, uh, and then those two things happen to be the same thing, and they're called the Brouwer group of my field. So instead of thinking of this machine as just giving me a conic, I'm going to think of it as giving me an element in the Brouwer group, which is just the isomorphism class of this conic, or you could also think of it as giving this quaternion algebra mod Brouwer equivalence. Okay, so this is just a gadget. The Brouwer group is really awesome. I am a big fan of it. I probably couldn't even give three lectures just on the Brouwer group, so this is basically all I'm going to say about it. <laughs> but we're going to focus on the two torsion, and the two torsion in the Brouwer groups are quaternion algebras and conics, and so that's the correspondence we're going to work through. So it's so the Brouwer group includes generalizations of conics, but it also includes conics. So this machine that I can think of, okay, I have this uh, thing that splits, spits, bleh, spits out a conic, and now I'm going to put another machine next to it that takes the conic and spits out its Brouwer class. And now I'm going to think of like the two things together. Okay, and then how do I replace this um, condition from quadratic reciprocity that the number of places that the conic fails to have local points is even, well, that comes from uh, what's called the fundamental exact sequence of global class field theory, <laughs> which 
hopefully sounds very important. It's, it is a very important fact. It, it encapsulates a lot. It's the bottom, bottom row that I have here, and it just relates the Brouwer group over a number field that embeds into the direct sum of the Brouwer group as the completions, and we understand exactly how it's cut out. It's that the sum of the, these invariants is, um, it goes to zero. Okay, and if you look at this, the two torsion of this sequence over Q is exactly quadratic reciprocity. It is equivalent to quadratic reciprocity. So if you want, you can just, if this is the first time you're seeing this exact sequence, you can just think of this, this is like quadratic reciprocity bonus, like quadratic reciprocity on steroids. Okay, and so I guess this is how I think of quadratic reciprocity over number fields. I just think of the two torsion of this exact sequence, uh, which is maybe cheating, but it's my talk, so that's, that's how I think of it. So now, um, this condition that's in the middle, that the, the set of places is, um, is even, I just change that to the sum of these invariants is zero. Okay, because the two torsion, the two torsion of Q mod Z is one half Z, and so if I add up uh, one halves, I get zero. Uh, I get an integer, so that's zero in Q mod Z. Okay, so this is, I don't know, a fancier looking, more generalizable way of saying what we had before. Okay, so now I've, but I, we still have this machine now, this, these two machines that fit together, and so I have to tell you how we, how we piece those together. Yes? The inv, uh, this is called the invariant map. So this is the fundamental exact sequence of global class field theory. There are also like theorems in local class field theory about the tel that tell you about the Brouwer group of KV. So this is written up more in the notes, but if V is a finite place, then the Brouwer group of KV is isomorphic to Q mod Z. So this, this MV is um, an isomorphism for all finite V, and then for Archimedean V, it's more boring. The Brouwer group of the reals is just one half Z mod Z, otherwise known as Z mod two, and the Brouwer group of C is trivial, so then those maps are less interesting. But so it's a, for finite V, inv sub V is an isomorphism, but it's a particular isom choice of isomorphism that fits together in this global way. Um, so for us, we just need to know uh, that it fits into this exact sequence, so it carves out what Brouwer K is, and then in the exercises, you'll work through what this means for the two torsion. So this is sort of a translation of the things that I said about conics just into things, into the Brouwer group terminology instead. Yes? Yes, that's coming next. I still haven't explained this red assume is still, I have not justified it at all. Right now it's like in my mind. I dreamed up this thing. Actually, so I didn't dream up this thing. This is coming. Manin made this obstruction. <laughs> this is not. This is not. Not my thing. But uh, in the way I'm presenting it right now, this this way of getting these Brouwer classes is not justified at all. It's purely in my imagination. We have to bring it. We have to figure out how to do that part. Oh my God! I forgot again. Okay. So the question was, yeah what is this black box? That wasn't the exact question, but <laughs> the more questions? Yes, and please just shout out if I miss, the lights are sort of bright, so sometimes I miss the hands. Okay, so the way we do this is it turns out this Brouwer group that I like, hand waved about and told you to refer to my notes is quite a general construction. And you can define it 
for basically any algebra geometric that you object that you want, you can take the Brouwer group of. So I talked about Brouwer groups of fields previously, but you can also define the notion of a Brouwer group of a variety, Brouwer group of a scheme. Um, and so, oh. So if we have a Brouwer group of a scheme and the definition is cohomological, so that means that it's completely functorial. So if I have an element in the Brouwer group of X, which is just some thing, and we'll talk about like what those things are. Uh, and then I have a, an F rational point, which I can think of as a map. The functoriality of the Brouwer group just says, so my machine is functoriality. That's, that's the way to think about it. My black box is I have a cohomological definition of the Brouwer group of X, and that is functorial. So it, it produces for me this black box, which takes an F rational point and gives me an element of the Brouwer group of F. Okay, so now instead of doing these squiggly black box in my imagination arrows, I'm gonna use the functoriality of the Brouwer group. So this, this squiggly arrow correspondence, uh, now I get my little x, and I just map it to x upper star of alpha. and. I mean, really, you can just think of this as like mathematical notation for a black box, <laughs> if you want, <laughs> right? This is just like, it is something that I'm allowed to do, and I have it, and it gives me, gives me this, this property. Okay, and then uh, I do the same thing on the adelic point side, and it turns out that the uh, map actually lands into the direct sum instead of the direct product that's not a big deal, but it's a thing that you, uh. but now you can sort of pattern match. Why does this work out so nicely? Well, we have Brouwer group of K here, and we have the direct sum of the Brouwer group of KVs there. So I should rearrange this picture and put my exact sequence instead there. And now from this map, you see, well, if I have a K rational point and I map it all the way to Q mod Z, Instead of going across the top and diagonal, I can go down and over, and because the bottom is exact, that means that the k rational points have to go to zero. So there is this intermediate set, which is exactly the inverse image of the points that go to zero. That sits here. going to let people look at this diagram. So this, this defines everything, but it's sort of a lot to take in. <laughs> so that's why I went through the examples, starting with the conic and going through. But I'll just leave this and take questions. People have comments. Yes? Sorry, does the image of the rational points under Yes, it's very dependent on alpha, yes, and that is gonna be a big theme coming up later. That is a great question. But so the, the image of the rational points, this map, phi sub alpha, it really depends on alpha. This black box thing that I put, I mean, that's why it's like sort of a joke that the pullback is a black box, but it's also not so much a joke because it's hard to predict what, what thing you're going to get. You really need to know a lot about the element alpha and what you're putting in and the points you're putting in and, and how it works. Other questions? Yes? Yes, that is, that is something you have to prove. Um, so, uh, okay, the, the short answer is because um, alpha extends to the Brouwer group, uh, to an element in the Brouwer group of a model of X over some ring of S integers for some S, and so then it, it goes there. I understand that answer was not supposed to make sense to everybody, just, just to be clear. Yes? Yes, yes, the, yes, phi alpha depends on alpha, and the inverse image depends on alpha, yes, so that's the next thing. So X, 
this set X A K of alpha. So uh, often this is thought of as a pairing between the Brouwer group and the set of adelic points going to Q mod Z. So we, we usually refer to this set as the set of adelic points orthogonal to alpha, like using linear algebra terminology. And then as many people are pointing out, uh, we can do this for all alpha. So actually the brouwer manin set is all of these. You take the intersection over all the alpha and the K rational points still live inside of there. And so the Brouwer set is the set of adelic points orthogonal to the whole Brouwer group. Okay. All right, let me try to think what I want to aim to get to. Okay, any more questions on this definition? Yes. The Brouwer group of the Adele ring is the direct sum of the Brouwer group of KV. That's another way that you can prove that it maps. Instead of using what I was doing, which I said, okay, since it's projective, the adelic points of X are the direct product of X of KV. And so then you map to the direct product and then you prove that it lands into the direct sum. You can instead do it functorially if you want and just say, okay, the set of adelic points is a map from spec of the Adele ring and then we pull back under that and Brouwer group of the Adele ring is the direct sum of the Brouwer group of KVs. That is another approach. More questions? Yes? That's right. Yeah, the top line is a map of sets because I'm just looking at the K points of X or the adelic points on X, so I'm forgetting all of the other geometric structure on it. So phi alpha is just a map of sets, which is why I pedantically wrote phi alpha inverse instead of kernel of phi alpha because it's not technically, well, it's not a map of groups. But when I was a grad student, I always wrote just the kernel of phi alpha and then pointed out that I should really write phi alpha inverse more correctly, but yeah. <laughs> Everything lands. If you work with two torsion elements, so if you start with a two torsion Brouwer X, which would give you this map where you go to a conic, then everything lands in the two torsion. But I could, and in all of the examples, I'm just going to pretend the only elements in the Brouwer group are two torsion. But there are higher order elements of the Brouwer group of X, and so then that you land into higher, uh, like one over n z mod z for some larger n. These are all really great questions. Okay. So maybe I will. Okay, let's just remind us where we started. What did we want to define this uh, for? So we have this, this Brouwer set, and uh, we've proved that it's an intermediate set. I mean, by definition, it's a subset of the adelic points, and by um, global class field theory, it contains all the K rational points. And our idea when we first started, the motivation for this was to find a set that we can use to witness that X has no Q rational points. So the set, we've got now that it, it contains X of Q or X of K, depending on what field you're working over, but we want to actually be able to understand it or compute it. So that is like the million dollar question. Can we actually do anything with this definition? enough to be able to witness it. Um, and so I think just given the time, I'll stop here, leave you on the edge of your seat, and we'll, uh, to be continued um, on Tuesday, tomorrow.